Alrighty, so it is 11 o'clock here in Vancouver, so we'll get started. Hello everyone, welcome to the April NCCEH and BCCDC Healthy Built Environment webinar, which is part of our Built Environment online discussion forum. My name is Tina Chen and I am a Knowledge Translation Scientist here at the National Collaborative Center for Environmental Health. And facilitating with me today is Sherido Galing, who is a project manager at the BC Center for Disease Control. We just like to acknowledge the land on which we're calling from within the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, which includes Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live, learn, work, and play within this territory. So throughout the webinar, please make sure to turn off your cameras and put yourselves on mute until the appropriate times. You may type your questions into the chat box at any time during the webinar and we'll get to them at the appropriate times. So today we have the great pleasure of having four amazing speakers from BC and Alberta who will be sharing with us their work on promoting well-being in urban environments. We will begin with an interactive exercise on equity led by Lily Raphael and Emily Johnson. Lily is a project manager at SFU um, and in this role, she supports economic recovery and resilience planning, the Economic Re 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 Reconciliation Initiative, and the Certificate in Community Economic Development. Her previous and current experience has mostly been in community and stakeholder engagement in rural First Nations and urban communities in support of community-driven planning, sustainability, and social impact in initiatives. She has a master's in community and regional planning, and is committed to the well being of people and land everywhere. And Emily is a community planner who is passionate about the potential for planning and design to promote health and well being. She believes in community knowledge and expertise as powerful levers to support equitable and sustainable dec decision making. Emily's background includes a Bachelor of Kinesiology and Masters in Community and Regional Planning. Her past experience includes projects focusing on urban design, active transportation, physical activity, sustainability, and social inclusion. Thank you, Lily and Emily. Now over to you. Great, thanks so much, Tina. And thank you to everyone who is joining us today. Um, so we are going to begin, as Tina mentioned, with a quick um, exercise that you'll do just on your own. Um, and it's a way to um, kind of get us settled into this uh, topic of equity and, and self-reflection and thinking about how um, our identity and backgrounds um, impact our ability to understand others' lived realities. So this um, exercise comes from a, um, a presentation that was given to the City of Vancouver Solutions Lab um, by Panthea Lee, who is from Reboot. It's an organization in New York City and uh, the topic was on building empathy through action research. So what we're going to do is um, you'll grab a pen and paper and um, we're gonna go through a series of slides and each slide is related to um, a particular identity, aspect of identity such as um, class, gender, race. And um, there's a list of sentences and you'll just mark a tick mark um, for every sentence that applies to you you don't need to keep track of which sentence is applies to which um, tick mark or anything. It's just um, a, a tick mark exercise. And um, at the end, you'll tally up kind of um, all these different numbers to, um, to show kind of um, how, how your identity um, is impacted by different systems and structures. So maybe we'll go to the next slide so you can see. Um, so you'll mark a tick mark for each statement that applies to you. And we'll go through each um, slide. We'll spend about a minute on each slide. So um, starting now.
We've got about 10 more seconds. Next slide, please. So the next one is um, race, ethnicity. <coughs> And next slide, please. Next one is gender. We just have 10 more seconds on this slide and uh, feel free to, you don't have to do it on the actual slide. If you'd prefer to just write on a piece of paper um, for yourself, that's fine too. Next slide, please. Ability. Ten more seconds. And citizenship is the last one. We just have 10 more seconds. All right, thank you. So you can um, just take some time if you wrote it on a piece of paper. Oh, we got check marks all over, this is fun. Um, so if you wrote it down on a piece of paper, you can um, tally it up. Um, and just for yourself, it's a way to reflect on um, how your identity and background might impact your ability to understand um, others' lived realities. Uh, for me personally, when I first did this exercise, it was really impactful to just see in which ways um, different aspects of my identity enable me to move through society and through my workplace with quite a lot of ease and privilege, and then others 
other aspects of my identity, I'm quite limited and restricted. So um, I hope that um, you found that um, insightful. And if I, it, it can be an emotional exercise for some, so please feel free to um, just take this time to take care of yourself and um, and tend to yourself if you. So thank you. Great, thanks for that, Lily. Um, so we'll move on to our first presentation, uh, which will be given by Susan Coward and Sue Holtzworth from the city of Edmonton, who will be talking about Edmonton's urban wellbeing framework. Susan is the manager of urban wellbeing in the city of Edmonton's citizen, citizen services department. She spent eight years in the city manager's office, working with three city managers and learned a lot about many different business areas and unique challenges. Prior to that, she worked as a neighborhood director in different geographical areas and got to learn about and apply community development and public engagement. She is currently on a steep learning curve with Recover, improving urban well-being and enjoying the journey. Sue is the project manager for Recover, improving urban well-being. Sue has also worked as a land use policy and strategic planner for three local governments, as well as the Winter City Manager for Edmonton's broad and holistic Winter City strategy and the accompanying winter design guidelines. To all her work, she brings a learning mindset and a systems thinking lens. Now over to you, Sue and Susan, thank you. All right, does it look all right on the screen here? Yep, you see yep. it, thank you. Yep. Is this black bar is not there? Nope. Okay, good. Nope. All right, well, thanks for having us here today. Susan and I were happy to share a bit about our work, about our learning journey, and what it's revealed to us about what it means to live well and be well, and what's needed to improve well being in our city. Oh. I'm not sure how to make the slide move ahead. Oh, um, if you click on the PowerPoint slide and click the arrow key. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Sue. Uh, we're in uh, Edmonton and we're on Treaty 6 territory and Mé Métis Re Region 4. Uh, we acknowledge that our city has many layers of place. As people have been living here thousands of years, Recognizing this and fulfilling our treaty obligations are fundamental to our mutual healing. For some organizational context, Recover is included in our corporate business plan under the Healthy City Strategic Goal, along with things like affordable housing and poverty elimination. It also fits with one of the big city moves, inclusive and compassionate, which is in our uh, municipal development plan and it's called the city plan that's on the screen there. So back in 2017, when Recover was getting started, it was assumed that it, to improve urban wellness meant improving safety, coordination, um, integration of services. And so it was very much a service focus and a reducing risk approach. The solution City Council proposed to us when they created Recover was to come back with a co-located wellness center for people without stable housing and using shelters and agency services. Oops. All right. Oh. Uh, we came back a year later telling Council that a well-being center um, would not improve urban wellness. Instead, we asked them to invest in a community social innovation platform that worked towards the right-hand side of this slide of increasing healing, nourishment, self-actualization. You may be wondering how we could come back a year later and tell council that their wellness center solution would not work. I'm a longtime city of employee and I never come back to a council to say, what you told us to do we're not, is not a good idea. The way we did this was by being true to the ethnography research and the voices of 20 street involved people who told us what mattered most to their well being. They had many suggestions, and not one was about having a one stop shop wellness center with a common intake approach 
and other service integration uh, processes. Like all social innovation, we did our best to open different ways of thinking, understanding the people at the center of our problems, and co-designing new practices with the community. We poached tools from all sorts of social innovation sites, and after two years, created 26 prototypes. After two years of research and, and testing rooted in social innovation approach, we decided to step back to review all our research and revisit our assumptions. So we wanted to know what did we really mean by urban wellness? What was our experience and research telling us about what it means to live well? We brought back our ethno ethnographic researchers, Inwith Forward, to help us with this work. So Inwith Forward went on a research quest, holding the ethnographic research at the center, and the result is a document called The Soul to City. And it's, it, it explains the framework and um, it's on our website, and when you have a chance, you can take a look. We also knew we had to be more intentional incorporating Indigenous perspectives con and concepts of well-being in our work. We invited Nehawin to help us with this. Nehawin is working to help ground us in four principles that re guide Recover's work. Deepening our understanding of layers of place. By recognizing the deep and long history of this place and understanding that it holds different meanings for different groups. is a big settler technology situated in the house. So lots of great into the space making and sort of ethical state taking quite many heritage of nature, of all knowledge and engaging with the intention of understanding each other. Aspiring to have two eyes seeing by recognizing the strength of indigenous ways of knowing and the strengths of Western ways of knowing and using them together. It is about collaboratively working, learning, and creating the Edmonton. And Renee, who came to live in Edmonton 15 years ago. And then on their last trip to Edmonton, they met William, a former police officer and veteran who was shot on the job, suffered tremendous PTSD, and has found himself for the last several years living on the streets of Edmonton. These profiles helped us segment, not in the traditional way along demographic information, but based on human attributes like motivation, sense of purpose, and belonging. Segments like the lonely actors who are on the cusp of action, navigating the loss of a former identity and weighed down by shame. Or the old timers who have been in the inner city streets for many years and see it as their home intertwined with their identity. These segments helped us identify new opportunities for action. These segments help us talk about the diversity of strengths and challenges of a group of people who are often generalized as vulnerable or homeless. We are able to see what common pain points and themes were for everyone. And grief and shame was huge. When we get to know the folks on the street, the researchers ask, what matters most to you? Those with next to nothing can really hone in quickly. What we've learned is that people who are arguably the most materially deprived say materiality isn't what matters most. Yes, it's often a significant barrier and something that creates stress, but it's not the top desired outcome. Across the sample, three things really stood out in terms of what matters most. A sense of purpose, a feeling of respect, self-respect as well as respect from others, and a sense of connection, a sense of not being alone, of having close relationships. I just wanna point out for the indigenous folks, um, the researchers spent time with, respect was often the top thing that was talked about. What stood out from holding this space for all these voices from Edmonton and from their literature review, which included reading about 3000 years of different traditions is how much well-being and wellness is defined as a relational phenomena. It's about connections both with, within and beyond the, ourselves. 
What becomes clear from all these stories, data and traditions is that wellness isn't a hierarchical concept. Most of you have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs shown as a triangle with basic needs at the, the base and higher order needs like self-actualization up above. The implication is that you address the basic needs first and many of our systems are set up that way. Interestingly, Maslow never intended it for it to be a hierarchy. He thought that all needs were actually equivalent and interrelated. And so instead of thinking about wellness where basic needs gain priority over higher order needs, we should think about both together. It's not food or meaning, it's about nourishment. It's about these, the way these things come together. So what would it look like if our service and policies treated higher order needs as equal? It's a bit of a concern. Oh, okay, sure, Sue. Sorry. No, it's all right, I did pause. It's a bit of a conceptual challenge in the past infrastructure, like buildings was the destination. Now it should be the route. We know housing works, but we need to support it through a new framework. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Sue. All right, thank you, Susan. I'm gonna just give you an example to illustrate the concepts Susan just talked about. So here's a tale of two shelters and how they feed people. But with this example, I want you to keep in mind that the same things I'm talking about here, um, they can apply in, di in different contexts. Uh, or even at different scales. So if this is a shelter, but it could apply to park, for example. Um, on the left-hand side is a fairly traditional meal service. You know, you know, um, people wait in a line outside or let in or agree to give it plastic molded trays and people wearing hairnets put the food in the trays and they're encouraged to sit down and eat, you know, fairly quickly. Um, the, the emphasis is really on efficiency, safety, and volume in making sure that people have some food in their bellies. On the right-hand side, it's a different kind of meal service, one that's more curated, more attention's paid to the atmosphere, to the lighting or music. When you get there, you're greeted by a host who gets to know you a little bit and then seats you with people who thinks that you might have something in common with. Food is served family style. You're encouraged to have conversations and linger and, um, and I don't know, maybe derive some meaning from being in that space together. People who experience both kinds of service of shelter spaces say that they're appreciative of both, um, but that they, with the one on the left, they might inadvertently feel a sense of shame. Like they might feel ashamed of having to turn up in a place like that and line up in a really highly visible queue outside. With the one on the right, they talk about having a sense of relaxation, a calm, and 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 finding meaning in being there. You know, so it's more than food, but nourishment. The our approach um, has evolved, and and now it's really about rebalancing these four scales. We feel like they've all gotten out of whack and are leaning all too much on their left sides. So, for example, with language. We hope that instead of using language that's really focused on deficits and needs, that we can include more language that acknowledges the gifts and resilience of those living rough. You know, after all, vulnerability really is a shared human condition. And the folks who need help also have a lot to give. Problems, how we frame problems, they're often boiled down to the need for housing and shelter, clothing, but it's really about more than basic needs. It's also about the need for dignity and connection. So we really need to cut through habitual ways of looking at people and problems. And the way we approach solutions, it's often just another, let's make a new program, a new service or, or build a new building. We really wanna balance that with more emphasis on thinking about the routines, the interactions, the roles that are taking place in those spaces, in those services and programs. And how we know things, not just through you know, quantitative data, uh, which of course we value, but making space for other ways of knowing, for example, indigenous ways of knowing. And we really think it's time to rebalance these four scales, put more effort on the right sides, not, not abandon the left, it's not an either or, it's both and, and it's about how they come together. And I like to think of it as a zipper or you know, braiding these two uh, sides of the scale together. Speaking of knowledge, though, um, 
that was on the previous slide, that scale. When we started, our definition of urban wellness was related to these indicators on this slide. And I'm sure they're all really familiar to you as they're related to the, similar to the social determinants of health, but we've now officially abandoned these. And we're in the process of figuring out a new way to evaluate and measure, one that's more tied to what we've learned about urban well being. And these are the sh key shifts that are underpinning our approach now. We're moving away from seeing well being as being the responsibility of government or social service agencies, of, of needing to connect people to community as well, seeing it as a whole community responsibility and. Um, in terms of involving community, not through a charity model of volunteering or donating stuff, but by connecting across difference, learning to navigate discomfort and build skills together, building healthy reciprocal relationships. And the last one I just want to point out on this slide is moving towards creating opportunities for strengthening well being through Indigenous and other ways of knowing. So this takes us to our well-being framework and at the heart of it are these six kinds of connections. They're the target outcomes for us that we're striving for. Connection to land and ground, to body and self, to family, friends, community, to the sacred, however you might define that, to culture and to the human project. And the human project refers to one's ability to grow and develop. I want to point out that we know things like housing, food, and clothing are all important, but that they we don't see them as the desired outcomes. We see them more as the means to the outcome. So as Susan said, not the destination, but the route to well-being. This next ring, the pastel one with the dots, shows examples of what those kinds of connections might look or feel like. It's like examples of behaviors or attitudes. So for example, connection to land and ground might look like feeling at home and connection to culture might be engaging in routines and or ceremonies of some sort. This is the whole framework put together and this last ring are, shows the tools for change or we sometimes call refer to them as levers and they really correspond to cultural or systems change levers. And just a note on design, they don't, they aren't static. They can affect any of the outcomes at the center, not just the ones they're touching. Um, the frames and narratives lever at the top corresponds to the underlying mental models that underpin a system. You know, what stories are we telling ourselves and each other's? Laws, regulations, and incentives, ones we're probably all quite familiar with, you know, what's in your, what rules, what bylaws do you have? What are you rewarding and punishing? Roles and resources, of course, includes traditional roles, but also includes non-traditional ones like peer roles or roles for who knows, gardeners, artists, other people like that. Interactions and environments is the place or space-based lever. What's in a space? How do you move through it? When, how? Routines and repertoires, that speaks to the repeating patterns. What's occurring over time? What are you celebrating? Knowledge and meanings. What are we paying attention to, measuring, evaluating, reporting on? What makes it into our reports? Um, so we're using this framework to help us design solution ideas and intentionally link, link the tools we're choosing to the specific connection outcomes we're targeting. And and we're, we're doing exercises with some folks, getting them to think through this more intentionally and think about maybe which additional levers might be helpful that they could use that they might not have thought of before. We know we really need to be intentional and specific and choose the right levers for the problem we're trying to address, for the outcomes we're trying to achieve and how they all line up. And we're, we think it can help keep straight the means versus the ends. So we've applied our framework, yep. Just real quick, we we have two minutes, so I just I'm so okay. Thanks. I'll just give you an example, a quick one. We've applied the framework to prototyping. We have some place-based ones. This is one of them. It was an older one called Project Welcome Mat, and focused on the sidewalk space in front of this social service providers building that was really uninviting um, and even intimidating. And so we were pulling 
the interactions and environments lever basically to see how it impacted on the connection outcomes. And what we found after uh, doing it all is that it really had a huge impact on how people saw themselves, how they saw the services there, provided dignity. And because we co-designed it with community, people took ownership over it and chose what to pay, where to put the furnishings. And they had a sense of pride in having contributed. So there were clear impacts to the human project, to culture, you'll notice the indigenous symbols and community connections. One more other quick one. This is another one on a different piece of sidewalk we're working on now, pulling the roles and resources and frames and narratives lever, targeting connections to culture and to community. Um, it's, it's installing some physical elements like lighting and the, and the art, which is made by indigenous street involved artists. But it's really, in my mind, the heart of it is we're planning a series of surprising office events targeting business community and people with lived experience of marginalization, getting them together to really connect across difference, um, using culture kind of as the, the tool to get these conversations going and the story sharing. Yeah, and so just to wrap up, thanks very much because we've used up our time. I, we're hoping that you can see, and we'll provide all the links to all of this information. We've really been focusing on that, those right-hand side. And we've got a, a, a very intensive prototype going on right now um, where it started, and I'm not gonna go through it because we're used up our time, but in 2017, it started with, the solution was a typical service provider uh, response. And now we're testing something which is a new role and brings uh, community people and people struggling uh, together and they heal together. So we've also got information on that. So thank you very much for listening to our presentation on Recover. Thank you so much, Sue and Susan. So we'll move on to the next uh, section, which is our oh, segment, which is question and answers. So we have a little bit of time to take maybe a couple of questions from the audience. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. And um, if not, we'll move on to the second presentation. We'll come back to questions later on. Um, so just give a little a brief moment for questions to come in, if there are any. Okay, first question. Um, do you know of any other communities doing a similar work? I would say that there are lots of opportunity uh, in situations where there are social innovation labs going on and people are, you know, tackling different things. But from a, a municipal government, I don't know of any other city that's doing something like this. Okay, thank you. Um... Why don't we move on to the second presentation then for now? And then if there are any more questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. We'll come back to them um, afterwards. So the next presentation is um, from Lily and Emily. And um, they will be talking about um, uh, centering well-being, repositioning the economy for resilient futures. Thanks, Lily and Emily. Over to you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Tina. Thanks so much, Sue and Susan. That's really interesting presentation. Um, so yeah, Lily and I are going to talk a little bit about um, repositioning the economy as a tool for well-being. And starting, um, just a reminder, I mean, you already introduced myself, but I'm Emily. I'm a healthy community planner with BC Healthy Community. I'm Lily Raphael. I'm the project manager with SFU's Community Economic Development Program, working in um, CE, our CED program and economic reconciliation. And I also wanted to just take a moment to acknowledge my coworkers, um, our director, Jeremy Stone, and then um, uh, uh, Shapela Matsiem, also known as Chief Leanne Joe from Squamish Nation, who is our transformative storyteller for economic reconciliation. A lot of what I'll be presenting um, throughout this presentation is based on their knowledge and um, and a lot of work that they've done. So I just wanted to acknowledge them. 
I'd also like to acknowledge where we're joining from. Uh, BC Healthy Communities offices are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people, which includes the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. And SFU CED's office is on the unceded traditional territories of Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. And just to note, like one of the reasons that we do these acknowledgements is to um, help keep it front of mind the colonial systems that create barriers uh, across Canada and, and in particular in BC in our local communities. It's good to have that in the front of our brains as we're doing this equity focus work in particular. So today we're going to talk uh, very briefly about why we're using the term repositioning. We're going to talk a little bit about where we're maybe trying to go and some ideas on how we might get there. So there, currently we know there are major inequities in many of our communities and there's often this narrative that uh, people have similar opportunities and capabilities to be healthy and well but we know that that's not true the local economic environment in particular is highly influential in our ability to lead happy and healthy lives and we've certainly seen highlighted with the disproportionate impacts of covid that inequities do exist there are racial income and disability related dis disparities in economic self-sufficiency. And there are barriers that exist for youth, seniors, newcomers, and residents whose first languages are not English. And while these ex inequities existed before the pandemic, it's important to keep in mind that they are a result of unfair and unjust systems that have favored the well-being of some over the well-being of others. So this is one reason why we're using the word reposition, because the current system does not work for everyone. And we believe that the economy can be used as a tool for well-being. We're also using the word reposition because well-being economies are not new. Um, so although currently the conventional focus of economic development is predominantly on capital growth and wealth accumulation, this has not always been the case. Um, and in particular, in Indigenous peoples in BC and all across Canada have um, sophisticated concepts of what constitutes a good life or um, ways of being that contribute to well-being, which um, have been refined over millennia and um, vary within each culture, place, and language. An example of this is the potlatch, um, on the, which was designed to be the means of trade between coastal Indigenous people um, across uh, this region of BC and sharing of wealth through gift giving and sharing knowledge protocols and practices. Um, so these indigenous e economic systems that are millennia old um, are closely reflect um, aligned to new newer terms of economic models such as circular and gift economies. Um, and so through this we just need to see the economy not as a means to profit but as a means to well-being. So where are we going? Um, so we're often now talking about envisioning um, resilient communities that um, allow for human flourishing for all. Um, but what are we really talking about when we think about resilience? Often there's this um, way of talking about resilience that is about bouncing back to a previous state um, or to what's considered a normal state. Um, but uh, bouncing back is firstly not possible because there are constant changes that we need to adapt to. So that's an idea that we need to move away from. Um, and it's not possible to return to what might be normal um, when people have had to close their businesses or leave work to take care of children um, or they were evicted from housing. These are all issues that we are seeing, um, especially now during the pandemic and um, increased um, increased incidences of climate disasters. Um, and so, and also moreover, bouncing back is not equitable. So the normal that we bounce back to has built-in conditions that make some people more vulnerable than others. Um, next slide, please. And then there's also this tendency to talk about communities that are facing equity, um, inequities in admiration for their resilience um, without 
thinking about the fact that they have had to be resilience, resilient owing to the course of the colonial systems structure from which they've been deliberately excluded from um, throughout history. So in addition to um, admiring their strength and resilience, institutions and society at large um, need to be thinking about why they've had to be resilient in the first place and consider how they can learn from communities, from these communities to address root causes of inequities. In particular, we need to honor that indigenous communities already have built in resilience from thousands of years of adaptation, which we can certainly learn from um, as we face increased risks in our, in our current world. So um, a different way of thinking about uh, resilience that SFU um, CED offers as we do our economic resilience planning and recovery work is um, maintaining our well-being while adjusting to constant changes in the world around us. So it's about identifying critical functions of the community um, that are needed for this, whether that's um, critical businesses, social services, um, different workforces, schools, healthcare facilities, and then places that provide cultural and social cohesion. It's also about um, providing, taking an all hazards approach. So regardless of the type of disaster or disruption in a community, um, the, the ability, the mechanisms to adapt and um, withstand these, these shocks um, should be applicable across all different types of disaster. Next slide, please. Um, and it's also about taking an all community approach. So um, SFUCED focuses um, especially on economic resilience planning and recovery processes, but this is applicable for um, across sectors of all types when doing resilience work that it requires the whole community. It's not just up to government or emergency response to, to um, build in these mechanisms or build in these these, um, these processes, it, it really requires um, all of the community. And through that, um, through that uh, collaboration and that cohesion, community-driven local economies are possible, um, but everyone has to be involved. Okay, so some ideas on how we might get there. So the first thing I'll talk about is the application of an equity lens, which can help us to identify inequities, vulnerabilities, and barriers and challenges within our current systems. More succinctly, it's a tool that can help us to identify the needs of all community members, in particularly those who have historically been excluded. Just a very quick refresh. I know everyone knows what equity is by now, but just in case. Um, equity, how we talk about equity at BCHC is the fair distribution of power, resources, and opportunities for participation in decision-making processes that affect individual and community well-being. And while equality, which is represented on the left-hand side of this image, uh, suggests that we treat everyone the same, equity suggests that we provide resources fairly based on need. So applying an equity lens often means asking ourselves a series of questions throughout our planning and policymaking processes, such as who's benefiting, um, who's included or excluded, what might be contributing to that exclusion, and what can I or we do differently to ensure inclusion at all stages of the process. So as a starting point for applying an equity lens in reference to economic development, it can be helpful to identify some goals for the future. Um, a just local economy will look different for everyone. Everyone has a unique local context and goals and visions will be different, but some goals for consideration include the reduction of barriers to employment and participation in the local economy, um, providing a range of, and a diversity of economic opportunities for citizens of all skill sets, abilities, and aspirations. Um, access to economic opportunities are prioritized and involuntary displacement is minimized by supporting community-based wealth creation and on-the-job tra training opportunities. 
And finally, um, economic and employment opportunities are integrated with other service provision um, and uh, planning sectors such as land use planning and transportation and access to affordable housing and recognizing again those kind of root things that allow people to participate at a higher level in their local economy. So what does this look like in practice? One of, I guess, Lily and I's favorite examples these days is this livelihoods continuum from the city of Vancouver's downtown east side economic development strategy. So this continuum acknowledges that there are diverse ways of building a livelihood and participating in the local economy and it depicts livelihoods on a continuum from informal to more formal and further organizes them by uh, self-employment and employment slash income generating. So this continuum really uh, throwing them back to some of the things that Sue and Susan talked about really acknowledges that it's not just about income or um, material wealth generation. It's, it's about providing purpose, um, respect and connection to the community. So even things that we typically don't really, or typical economic development strategies don't acknowledge such as survival work, um, like binning or, binning or vending, um, or even including gray and black market survival works such as small drug sales or sex work are included in this continuum and it, it really recognizes at the end of the day people are surviving using the means that are available to them and by recognizing all of these different pathways and ways that people participate we're able to be a bit more responsive in the interventions that we design and um, help people move around on this continuum based on their needs and accordance and in accordance with their life stages. So an equity lens can be helpful because it can help us to really understand our unique community context and the needs of everyone in our community, not just those who have historically been prioritized, i.e. white settler communities. Um, it can also um, help us to frame our work and consider experiences outside of our own to develop stronger interventions and it can really help us to identify some of the systemic barriers that are preventing people from being healthy and well and help and in including everyone in the design and decision making we can start to design programs, policies, and strategies that are a bit more responsive to community need and address the actual challenges um, that are contributing to vulnerability in our communities. So thanks, Emily. Um, so whereas the equity lens is really instrumental in helping us um, understand the problem and the different dimensions, um, um, the CED approach kind of tacks onto that and is a systems approach to problem solving for community um, well-being. So it's um, a way in which to kind of design different interventions along those um, along those lines of addressing equity, equity goals. So there's a lot of different um, ways of thinking about community economic development. Um, it's been around as a term for the past few decades, since the 60s or so, but there are definitely other ways of being that have predated it before it. And um, uh, so, but for SFUCED, there's, we have these five principles that I will go through um, quickly. So the first one is um, livelihood focused. So um, human flourishing and social development are essential to economic development. Um, interventions that UCED approaches integrate determinants of, determinants of health, considering how access to healthcare, housing, education, social standing, um, impact the ability of um, the economy to enrich livelihoods. Um, the next one is um, diverse and inclusive. Um, so CED interventions address historic and ongoing inequities and, and marginalization of Indigenous Black people of color and create economic opportunities for people across different abilities, skill levels, capacities, and interests. Um, it also uh, relates to diverse economic models within um, within a community. So it might be social enterprises or um, 
community impact investment uh, circles or cooperatives. And so again, it's thinking back to the livelihood spectrum of many ways for people to participate in the economy. Um, and then the third one is related to sustainability. Um, so humans are very much part of natural systems and um, solutions are designed for the well-being of future generations. This is very much aligned to um, indigenous concepts of sustainability and seventh generation planning. And then um, place based is the fourth one. So um, initiatives build off of local strengths and assets and um, build local capacity where needed. And lastly, um, community controlled, meaning that community, um, there's community ownership over processes and initiatives through grassroots participatory planning um, and local capacity is built um, for local institutions to serve as connection, connectors between community and more senior levels of government. So a helpful way to think about CED is to contrast it to mainstream economic development. Um, so whereas mainstream economic development might be focused on creating jobs, um, CED approaches are about creating the right kinds of jobs and businesses that reflect the community's values local assets and needs, um, whereas mainstream economic development is focused on generating wealth. Um, CED approaches are about um, equity, so considering how that wealth and resources are going to be distributed to those who um, are most in need of them. Um, mainstream economic development is often focused on large-scale um, site-based sorts of development projects whereas community economic development generally starts on a pretty small scale and grows um, where possible and where it makes sense. And is very much based in place and the local identity of, um, of local communities. There's also some mainstream economic development um, tends to attract outside companies as a way to increase um, business or um, investment in a community. Um, and CED approaches are about strengthening local businesses and um, capacity of workers first and foremost. Um, mainstream economic development is focused on economic growth as often the end goal, whereas CED is, um, has like a quadruple bottom line of um, addressing social, cultural, ecological, as well as economic challenges, um, all for the goal of achieving well-being. So what does this look like in practice? Um, one example that um, I'm giving is Clementum uh, storage facility in the city of Kamloops. It's easy to take for granted having a place to store your stuff if you have um, stable housing. But for those who um, have um, unstable housing or experiencing homelessness, it's um, hard to hold down work or go to job interviews or access services or appointments if um, there isn't a safe place to, um, to keep your stuff while doing so. So this storage facility is owned by the city of Kamloops and operated by Kamloops Aboriginal Friendship Society and um, provides space for people to store their belongings in um, these really large heavy duty bins um, as they go about their daily lives. They have, I think it's 65 units available there. And since opening, it's expanded its offerings to include charging stations, laundry services, washrooms, showers, um, and also to serve as a, a mailing address for people if they are in between addresses um, or haven't yet found um, stable housing. So this is just one example of what a CED intervention can look like. Again, it's it, it's seemingly small, but can have um, a large impact on um, helping provide stability and support for people in order for them to um, work towards um, their livelihood or to move between one type of livelihood to another if we think about um, going back to that livelihood continuum. Um, and again, CED can be driven by many different actors. So or a combination of a collaboration of different actors. So in this case, it's through um, local government as well as um, a local service organization. There's also community organizing, nonprofits, um, social enterprises, community impact investments. So there's many entryways into CED. Um, 
And ultimately, I want to emphasize here that CED is not just about job creation, as we were saying, it's about looking at the whole picture and um, seeing what sort of dots need to be connected between people, services, and the economy, and what gaps need to be filled. Um, policy and the market are currently failing. So one thing to note with um, relation to this facility is that it has continuously been at capacity. Um, so we need to also think about how we can further enable these initiatives so that they can expand and um, grow into the future according to current and immediate needs of the community. So a couple of takeaways or hopefully some of the things that you got from our presentation. Um, applying an equity lens can help us to further understand inequities within our communities and systems and using a CED approach and repositioning the economy as a tool for well-being can help to reduce those inequities and contribute to a more just local economy and community overall. And resilience enables human flourishing and requires all of us to work together across sectors and positions in the community. And going back to the um, reflective activity, it's important to see ourselves very much as a part of these systems that we are able to engage in and help transform. So um, this is an invitation from your position in the system to consider what opportunities there are to center well-being in your local community. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lily and Emily. Um, so we'll move on to some of the comments and questions that have been coming in through the chat box. If you want to follow along, just click on the chat window or the chat button. Um, so there was a question that came in from Brian for, I believe it was for Sue and Susan at the beginning. Um, can you describe how the leaders in your prototype projects um, do their work? and how your clients' needs for our health and social care are being met. Do you wanna tackle that, take that one, Susan? Why don't, why don't you start, Sue? Okay, well, I'd like to say that in the first year we had coaches that were helping us to learn how to do prototyping uh, using a real human-centered design approach. And we also used a city connector model. So having somebody from the core team be on each of the prototype teams to help kind of navigate, well, bureau bureau bureaucracy mainly. And with uh, Nehewin's help with our effort to um, understand, to do more self-location exercises and, and develop in an effort to develop two-eyed seeing, we're, we're doing more kind of self-location exercises at the beginning of, every meeting basically with, with the prototype teams. And we also have prototyping toolkits. And we use, as part of those toolkits, we encourage the groups to use storyboards as a way to really center people's experience that for whom the prototype is for at, you know, within the design of the prototype. And then it, with some prototypes, they are directly involved in co-designing it. There's opportunities for direct involvement. Susan, what did you wanna add? Um, what was the second part of the question, Tina? Um, how your clients' needs for health and social care are being met? And what training do you provide them? Yeah, I think what I would just add is we really don't train people if they're interested in participating. And we often are trying to recruit people who are at the center of the problem, who are experiencing the barriers. We just ask them to show up. And uh, as Sue said, we provide quite a lot of facilitation support so they won't get frustrated wondering what are we supposed to be doing now so uh, we in to Sue's point we really try to set the um, space so it's safe and so you can have really opposing points of view because that's what you want so that's mainly what we do and I am so looking forward to finding out about cam loops because there was a prototype about storage and it didn't get very far so that's super we're going to steal those ideas Perfect. Okay. Um, so next question or a comment, I guess, this is for Lily and Emily. Um, it's about um, how K-12 and early year systems might be uh, 
might contribute to the work that you're doing. Don't know if you're able to comment on that. Yeah, I think it refers back to the slide about um, resilience requiring all of us. So thank you, Cindy, for um, pointing that out. And definitely, you're absolutely right that it's um, all um, levels of education that are absolutely essential in community resilience. Um, and that is something that um, is part of our economic resilience planning process is it involves um, the educational institutions as well. So essentially, um, economic or resilience planning involves kind of mapping out the different um, assets in a community and the critical um, services and parts of this of of the community that are absolutely critical to to survival and to um, in order to withstand um, shocks. And so that is absolutely an element. And um, I apologize for missing that in the in the slide. Thank you. Okay, um, so next question from Brian. Um, this is also for Lily and Emily. Um, how does self sufficiency figure in this discussion of well being? Or perhaps even for Sue and Susan? Anybody, anybody have any desires to answer that one? I mean, I don't know is what my first initial thought is. Um, but I do think self-sufficiency is an important indicator of, of, you know, being able to make choices for your own well-being and not being reliant on others for everything uh, is helpful in moving towards, you know, that feeling of, you know, having that purpose, having that respect, and having that uh, sense of connection that Sue and Susan were talking about. So, and if they have anything to add to that, I would throw it to them. <laughs> In our framework, I would say it totally fits under the connection to the human project, you know. So you're, you know, the ability to kind of self-actualize, right, like to, to reach your potential. I think that's where it fits in our framework. Yeah, and I would also, oh, sorry, go ahead, Susan. You go ahead, Lily. I would just also add that it, it fits into the um, CED approach um, through human flourishing or being livelihood focused. And um, when thinking about, you know, like the livelihoods continuum and the ways in which people can like maybe ladder from one type of livelihood to the next, um, a lot of If I'm a volunteer and I want to work with someone, I've got to get out of my mind that I'm helping that person. And I've got to be feeling I'm entering the relationship to get as much as I hope they get from me. So I think reciprocity is another um, important, and we're, we're trying to learn about that. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? All right. Uh, next one is about the... The well-being ec the economy work from New Zealand, the circular economy or the donut economy. Um, Nanaimo has just adopted the donut economy and it's being discussed in Victoria. Just uh, are there any comments about those uh, that work on the well-being economy? Yeah, I can comment um, quickly on that. Definitely there's a lot, as I was saying in the well-being um, the slide on how well-being economies are not new. There's definitely a lot of different um, examples of well-being economic models that could be considered, including um, from New Zealand. There's also Summa Kausai from um, Ecuador and from other Andean countries. Um, so there's, yeah, there's certainly a lot out there. And, and I think that's what we were just trying to emphasize is that the it's, it's not necessarily a new con uh, concept and it's, um, you know, just something that needs to be, needs repositioning in what, in how we think about the economy and what we're using it for. Um, 
and the donut e economy is also yeah again one of those an, another model that relates to that um there's a lot of examples so it's it's hard to include all of them in our but i'm excited to hear about um the work in Nanaimo and also what victoria is doing so thank you for bringing that up Okay, perfect. So with that, we'll move on to the next phase of our webinar, which is small group discussions. So we'll break up into, um, we'll assign you to groups of four to five per group. Um, and we want you to sort of think about the equity activities we did at the start and the information on economic recovery and community well-being that you've just heard. So I'm just pulling up the questions now. One second. Okay. Um, so what resonate, resonated the most for you? What are you wondering? And what big opportunities do you see at the moment? So um, if you want to maybe just copy or just write that down somewhere. So you have a reference for our, your group discussions and we'll um, break you up into smaller groups. And we'll come back in about 10 minutes or so and to, to share your discussions, maybe some thoughts and um, findings from your small group discussions. All right, let's uh, try that out and go ahead with that. Thanks, Sherito. It's our first time doing this, so um, hopefully it goes well. <laughs>
Hi everyone, welcome back. Do we all have, do we have um, everyone back in the main room? Just a few more seconds before everyone joins back in the main room. Um, I think Sue and Susan and Lily and Emily are still in the breakout rooms. Oh, are you all back? Okay, perfect. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> here. Great. Thanks. Thanks all for joining the, the, the activity. So um, why don't we share some of our findings from the discussions? You can either share in the chat box if you want, or you can unmute yourself to speak up. Any insights? Um, thoughts to share? I'll jump in. Um, Steve with Rethink Urban. Uh, our group, it, it was interesting, just so much good information out there right now. Um, and, and so interesting to see, uh, see what other cities are doing around well-being. And um, I, I'm just looking forward to to networking more with uh, with some different people that are directly involved in this. Um, again, I'm I'm not sure if anybody realizes the work that the Canadian Municipal Network on Crime Prevention is doing, uh, but they're doing some fabulous work around community safety and well-being. So I'll just throw that out there. But great session today. Really appreciated the information. Thanks, Steve. Great. Cindy Andrew here, and, and I'm, I'm going to share a thought that we were talking about in our little uh, group of, uh, of four. Um, and it was really around this, this notion of that we're, there are lots of people and organizations having similar conversations. They may call it things, different things. So for instance, on this call I was just on, we were talking about there were some folks who are really championing around the, the, um, the geriatric population. And, uh, and we had a conversation about what's good for kids is good for, for grand, grandparents and everybody in between. Um, there are people who come at safe, um, health and well-being through a safety lens. And Steve would be a good example of crime prevention through environmental design. I come at it from healthy communities and healthy schools. And I guess I, I wonder if part of our challenge and um, is and not that it's a bad thing because I'm you know I'm a firm believer whatever window or door we come through let's all get around the same kitchen table because in essence we're talking about the same fundamental elements of what we know is a healthy prosperous prosperous community where where people and economies thrive um, but just that that intersection and the, those interrelationships and and how to help break down some of the silos and make and not seem like we're in essence competing with each other but actually reinforcing efforts from a holistic perspective so lots of questions no brilliant answers um and of course something that's always missing and that all of us i'm sure are pained to be thinking about um is the connection with the almighty buck and how you know just the realities of the world we live in is that that the the synergies with we know we need a healthy vibrant community where people are flourishing, whatever their age level, if we want to have a strong economy. And so that notion of prosperity and how they're related and integral to each other, um, it feels like a no brainer, but I'm not sure we, we the Royal We has done a good enough job yet of, of making that argument in a succinct enough way. And, and um, yeah, so I'll be quiet and are my more than two thoughts. Sorry about that. <laughs> Great, thanks. Anyone else want to share? Yeah, it's Brian here. Uh, I'm with the BC Ministry of Health and I'm, I'm really just uh, delighted, amazed to how many different kinds of approaches are being taken uh, to um, 
as Cindy mentioned, build healthy communities and uh, how deep we can go and how wide we can go. Uh, promoting citizen health, health means uh, different things to different segments of the population, obviously. And uh, it's great to see how deeply you've uh, dove into this issue of, uh, um, and um, at this uh, time, especially with COVID upon us, these divides are getting worse. The inequities are getting widened. And um, it's so important to bring this in into our into our thinking in so many areas of government work and and working across sectors with uh, different ministries with different organizations with local governments um so thank you very much for this presentation um i'm particularly happy that in bc we're we're uh, grappling with the complex problem of the social dimensions of built environments. Communities are, are people. Built environments are the containers in which these communities exist. And there's an interaction between the both, obviously, and, uh, and, we, and human needs are what they are in regard to built environments and communities too. So a very thoughtful present, a bunch of presentations from all of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, uh, we have about maybe two more minutes to share our thoughts. Or I'll share discussions. mine. Sure, thanks. Um, so I'm an HBE or lifer. <laughs> I'm in it for the long term. And I think one thing that we were talking about in our breakaway group was the fact that how we have moved, how far we've moved on the journey from just looking at land use policies and practices to how um, other features uh, impact people's daily walk through life. And um, one of the participants in the room was from Ontario and is bound somewhat by um, community, a little different community structure than here in BC. And uh, we were talking about the different resources that are now available, one of which is the social environments framework, which I'm sure Sherito will be able to put the link up so that everyone can see. I mean, there's lots of tools and resources available. This is just another one. It's a good resource, but it does talk about that social aspect um, and how it impacts health and how I think more importantly, how we've morphed from the term health to well-being and well-being being a very large umbrella that contains a lot more than just your physical activity level or your chronic disease rate. And it uh, talks about really every all the struggles that people and the barriers and opportunities that people go through. So it, again, I just wanted to give you more of a heads up that there is another resource that's out there that can be used, the framework. Thanks for sharing. Um, yes, yeah, Sherito did put a link to the social environments framework in the chat box. Um, so at this point, uh, we have about a minute left. So I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us today and particularly to our speakers, Lily, Emily, Susan, and Sue for sharing your work with us and to um, provide this enlightening discussion. And um, we hope that you found this webinar to be useful and inspiring for your work. And so next week we'll post webinar recording on the NCCH website and we'll all share it to all registrants. And we'll also um, send out a long evaluation survey for this survey, or sorry, for this webinar. So please help us fill it out so we can improve our future webinars. And uh, for those of you familiar with the uh, NCCH BCTDC Healthy Built Environment Discussion Forum, we'll actually be moving to a new platform later this month, which will hopefully be easier to, to use and to engage in discussions and resource sharing. And um, with that, thanks everyone and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>